Good evening, it's 11 in the night and I'm back with a new book to analyze today. The name of the book uh, that I have in my hand is A Rude Life, The Memoir. It's an autobiography of senior journalist V. Sangvi. When I first read the title of the book, A Rude Life, The Memoir, I thought why he has decided to call his autobiography The Memoir. So before I talk about The Memoir, let me first uh, explain to you uh, why he has decided on the title A Rude Life. In his book, he writes that his mother told his principal, principal of his school, uh, he was studying in Mao school, uh, uh, Rajasthan. Uh, his mother told the principal of Mao school not to take Veer Sanvi seriously, not to be offended with any of his actions or words because all Sanvis are rude. So Veer Sanvi says that I come from a rude family. That's why he has decided to call his autobiography A Rude Life. Now coming to the second part of this autobiography, The Memoir. Why Veer Sanvi has decided to call his memoir The Memoir? Remember, even Salman Rushdie did not have the audacity to call his memoir The Memoir. Uh, Salman Rushdie wrote his autobiography in 2012 and it was called Joseph Anton a memoir. So I have absolutely no idea why B. Sanvi decided to call his autobiography the memoir. Maybe this shows how big an ego he has. So it's a manifestation of his far uh, bigger than you know universe ego. This is what I would say. But let us not dwell on the title itself. I am going to you know talk you through the entire book, 416 page length book. Uh, the book is divided into 61 chapters and he talks in detail about his childhood till today. That is, he was born in 1956, he has talked, he has talked about his life uh, till the book went to the press, 2021. <clears throat> now I will tell you the strength and the flaws of the book in the very beginning and I will pick up few stories from the book uh, just to illustrate that how V. Sangvi has tried to portray a life he has lived since 1956. So first the strength of the book. The book is written in a very simple language. If you have studied up till class 6th, you will have absolutely no problem understanding this book. You will not have to reach out to a dictionary. There is not a single difficult word that you will not be able to understand. The book is quite lucid. It's uh, uh, racy if I can use that word and uh, it is full of anecdotes so it keeps you entertained these are the strength of the book now coming to the flaws of the book two strength two strengths that I just mentioned they can also be counted as flaws number one language though the book uh, races through uh, the language is quite brittle it doesn't have punch it never uh, it never makes you feel moved that's flaw number one of the book second flaw of the book is the manner in which the chapters have been put together it feels uh, that either the writer or the publisher they are trying to make a coherent life out of an incoherent life and when you are reading these chapters you also have uh, an ominous feeling that there are many aspects of his life that are being deliberately left out and only the positive sides are being talked about. The third flaw and this is the biggest flaw. Veer Sangvi talks only about the positivities in his life. We Sangvi tells us only the goody goody things that have happened in his life. We are never told about the flaw in his character. Remember, this is, a, this is an autobiography. This is a memoir. What is a memoir? A memoir is when you write, uh, when you write about your entire life. And an autobiography memoir, they are written at the end of your life. It is written in the twilight of your life. When you are 70, 75 and when you know that you don't have much left in you or you know you don't have much time left and in your autobiography you tell a story as dispassionately as possible when you are writing your life story you try to detach yourself from the story and you do not get emotionally involved with it it is not that you have to show yourself in the best possible light 
If you have made mistakes in your life, you come out clean on those aspects. If you have done something that you are embarrassed about, you talk about all those things. Think of Vinod Mehta, one of my favorite journalists who died in 2015. He wrote his biography, Lucknow Boy. Now, he did not talk only about his strengths, how he went to England, how he picked up a menial job in England, then how he at the age of 25 decided to educate himself by listening to BBC. No, he did not talk only about the strengths. He also talked about how he betrayed a woman, how he decided not to, you know, take responsibility uh, of a girl that he had fathered, how he refused to marry a woman who was insisting on marrying him and how he felt very guilty towards the end of his life. So he has told us his story from all angles possible. There are people who criticize him uh, that look he was such a churlish man that he slept with a woman and when he was pregnant he deserted her. But remember this is we come to know about this episode by reading his book. So he is not hiding facts. Now we wonder that is V. Sanvi such a gentle man that he has never made mistakes in his life? I'm not talking about mistakes only with women. There could be so many mistakes. You are in journalism since 1975. So in last 45 years, you have not been wrong-footed or you have not taken a single false step in your life. Is that true? Or you have not made mistake with your family, you, have not made, ma uh, you haven't made mistake with your friends, you have never betrayed anyone, you have not done anything in your life that you are embarrassed about? No, nothing. You have lived such a beautiful and brilliant life that there is no place for mistakes? I don't believe it. Because every human being once in a life makes mistake. Every human being, irrespective of uh, place and time of his or her living. This is impossible that people will not be making mistakes. But in this book, we do not come across a single thing which could be called even remotely negative. We are just told that how great I am. At such a young age, I became an editor. I went to Oxford University and when I returned, I picked up a job with India Today and I never looked back. How I picked up a job with a newspaper in Calcutta, the statesman and how uh, at the time of my joining the statesman or this newspaper did not have much standing in the public but how I turned it around. So it's always about how great I am, how when I join a publication, how I turn its fortune around. What about your uh, drawbacks? What about flaws in your character? Absolutely nothing. The book is totally silent on this and this I count as the biggest flaw of this book. I would like to, you know, digress for a second and also uh, acknowledge, also confess the fact that Veer Sanvi has blocked me on Twitter. So, uh, if I am criticized for criticizing his book, I don't think I am criticizing his book, I am critiquing his book. Uh, I think it is very important for me to come out clean and be honest. In 2020, when the pandemic was at its height, uh, there was a Twitter spat between me and Veer Sanvi. Twitter spat in the sense, I, I won't call it a spat because he had tweeted something and I had uh, mentioned in passing Radia tapes and he blocked me. I thought it important to digress and point this out uh, because when you are critiquing somebody's book, you also need to come out clean that what kind of relation you share. I don't know him personally, so one negative uh, experience that I have with him of him blocking me on Twitter. I wanted this to uh, be known to all of you. But I'm, this is not going to color my judgment of the book. Just because he has blocked me on Twitter, this is not going to make me uh, turn against him and say something nasty about him. Coming back uh, to the book. As I said in the beginning, the book is divided into 61 chapters. Uh, he tells his life his story. He traces his uh, a story from his childhood, how the loss of his father uh, changed him because at a very young age he lost his father and when he lost his father that is the time when he realized that he has responsibilities because when his father was alive he thought that his father had a lot of money and his father also thought that he had a lot of money but when he died, the son Vee's father, the family discovered that his father did not have much money in his account. So we Sangvi all of a sudden realizes that at the age of 15 he has a responsibility on his shoulders and uh, that changed him 
as a human being. He became a very responsible human being. His childhood was lost. It was not that uh, when he was a teenager, he was going around and fooling with his friends. He had responsibilities. We are told this in the very beginning. As the book progresses, we are uh, told about his different jobs with different publications, how he went to join Oxford University. There are occasions when he criticizes himself, but he criticizes himself in such a way that it becomes his own praise. For example, I am a person who trusts everyone and people take benefits uh, of this. So the criticism is that I am a fool, but he is portraying it in such a way that uh, it becomes a kind of praise. Wow, you are such a person that you never betray anyone. It's, you know, people taking advantage of your good nature. It's like uh, aunties in our neighbor saying, my son is so good now that he is bad actually. He doesn't take care of himself. He is always taking care of other people and people take, uh, people take advantage of his good character. This is how he criticizes himself. There are occasions when he says that, you know, I'm not able to judge people very easily and I get uh, taken for a ride. These are the self-criticism. It won't even be called criticism. It won't qualify as criticism. As the book progresses, different chapters on different aspects of his life, it becomes a progression of his personal relationship with different politicians. His relationship with Atal Bihari Vajpayee, his relationship with the High Minister of the Congress, his relationship with Rajiv Gandhi. So the entire memoir is reduced into a series of relationship that he built with different uh, important politicians from different eras. And you are left wondering that should a journalist come so close should a journalist share such a personal relationship with politician? If you are going to be so close to your subject on whom you have to report, how you are going to critique them, how you are going to take a stand when uh, something, uh, when a scandal comes out in the open. And when I read this book, this is what surprised me that the kind of relation uh, you know the kind of relation he is building with everyone and yes it can be argued that because of his close relation with different people he is not able to take a dispassionate view on those politicians i will give you two examples rajiv gandhi is a wonderful man he is a man who is very honest he is such an honest man that he is taken for ride by different people uh, but we never come across the kind of statements that Rajiv Gandhi made, like uh, in the aftermath of Indira Gandhi's assassination, Rajiv Gandhi said very callously that when a huge tree falls, the earth around it shake. He was trying to rationalize the anti-Sikh uh, pogrom that happened in the aftermath of Indira Gandhi's assassination. Now, Veer Sanghvi talks about the anti-Sikh riot, but he does, does, does not talk about Rajiv Gandhi's statement. He does not talk about how the central government uh, refused to deploy army. He refused, uh, Veer Sanghvi fails to talk about how the entire government machinery, I will use the word collaboration, they collaborated and I am using this word deliberately. They collaborated with each other to ensure that Sikhs were punished. But Rajiv Gandhi is never criticized in this book. So it is always different ministers, Jagdish Titler or you know different small uh, Congress workers, those who are not important enough. But Rajiv Gandhi never uh, gets the flack. Exactly the same with Atal Bihari Vajpayee. He is telling us that what kind of personal rapport he had with uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee. I used to go to Atal Bihari Vajpayee's residence, that is Prime Minister's residence, and spend Diwali with him. And I used to stay with him for a day or for a couple of days. And we see that we Sangvi never criticizes uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee for his policy. There is no critique of the policies. There is no analysis of NDA's policies. Atal Bihari Vajpayee, when he was Prime Minister, he was accused of, you know, uh, keeping his foster daughter and her husband with him. And these, uh, this couple, 
Atal Bihari Vajpayee's foster daughter and husband, they, both of them were accused of running the PMO. Now, Veer Sangvi had such a close relation with Atal Bihari Vajpayee, he must have come across son-in-law and daughter of Atal Bihari Vajpayee, he should have told us something about them, his experience with them and what he encountered. We are not told anything about them. So again, it feels that Veer, Veer Sangvi's judgment on a politician, on a person is coloured by his personal relation, which is a very bad thing because as a journalist, you have to be very dispassionate and that's why in the beginning I said that there has to be distance between the subject, between the journalist and his subject. If there is no distance, interpersonal uh, distance, then your writing, your uh, thoughts on them, they, they, it, they might get coloured with your uh, rapport, personal rapport with them. This is exactly the problem that even uh, Param Thapar suffers from. Even in his memoir, he never criticizes people with whom he has personal relations. So, Lal Krishna Advani is a gentleman, but we are never told about the flaws of Lal Krishna Advani and how single-handedly he radicalized a large swathe of this country by taking out the Rath Yatra. Lal Krishna Advani is never criticized by Karan Thapar in his autobiography, even though Karan Thapar identifies himself as being on the left side of the political spectrum and is speaking for people who are on the margins of society. Karan Thapar never criticizes Aung San Suu Kyi because his family had personal relation with Aung San Suu Kyi. So Aung San Suu Kyi, despite the fact that she is always silent on, she was always silent on what was ha happening with uh, Rohingyas in Myanmar. She is treated as Aunt Suu Kyi, a very soft-spoken woman. Veer Sangvi and his autobiography suffers from exactly the same problem. The book never, this autobiography never talks badly about people with whom he had personal relation. But with people with whom he did not share good relationship, he has very bad things to say. For example, Narsimha Rao, even without much evidence, he insinuates that Narsimha Rao was uh, not a bad human being but a bad politician and a corrupt politician. Now, no evidence is given to prove his point that Narsimha Rao was a corrupt politician but he insinuates that he was. Why? Because he did not have personal relation, he did not know Narsimha Rao first hand. Uh, so he is a cunning man, he is a man who is always gaming the system, he is a manipulative man. And why he is criticizing Narsimha Rao? Number one, Narsimha Rao cannot defend himself, he is a dead man. And Sonia Gandhi is alive. So to curry favor with the Gandhi family, you have to abuse Narsimha Rao. I pick these three examples, Rajiv Gandhi, Narsimha Rao and Atal Bihari Vajpayee to bring one important point home. That important point is that we Sangvi, when he is talking about a politician or anyone else, a business personality, his judgment on that person will be colored by the kind of relation he shares with them, which is a very bad sign, which is a very bad thing for a journalist. Now coming to other part of the book. Uh, when I was reading this book, he came out, Veer Sangvi came out as a show off. He is dropping names and it felt like he is a serial name dropper. Talking about Tony Blair, Tony Blair's wife. Memoir is about putting your entire life in the right perspective. Your autobiography should contextualize your not only career but the entire life. We are not here, we are not willing to spend 700 rupees, the cost of this book is 699 rupees, we are not willing to spend 699 rupees to know that what kind of conversation you had with Tony Blair's wife and what Tony Blair's wife said about Gordon Brown. Now that is neighborhood gossip. Our aunts gossip about their uh, sister-in-laws and so on and so forth. We Sangvi is gossiping about Gordon Brown and you know, uh, Tony Blair's wife, but at the end of the day it is gossip. You are gossiping about 
people who have occupied high offices in different parts of the world, while our neighborhood aunties, they gossip about people who are not important. But the fact of the matter is, both of them qualify as gossip mongers. So why shall I spend 699 rupees to know that what Tony Blair's wife said about Gordon Brown? What Tony Blair said about you? Now we Sanvi also comes out as a person who is self-obsessed. Narcissist is the right word. When I met Tony Blair and Tony Blair said that I remember you and I thought that he was lying, his PR team must have informed about me and it was his way of flattering me. I don't know why would Tony Blair flatter V. Sanvi because V. Sanvi is, is a senior journalist but he is also considered to be a lightweight journalist. Uh, but next when I met him I realized that he actually remembered me because he quoted me. When I met him last in the late 1990s, he quoted me from there and I realized, oh my god, Tony Blair remembers me. So this is a kind of self-obsession that Tony Blair, the ex-Prime Minister of Britain or the contemporary Prime Minister of Britain, he remembers me. George W. Bush, he remembers me. Tony Blair said to my son that you ask better question than your father. So again, talking about your family and things that are not relevant for a memoir. A memoir, as I said, puts your life in, pers in the right perspective for your reader. Uh, an autobiography, a memoir, it contextualizes what you have done since your childhood. And it is written at the end of your life, in the twilight of your uh, life. This book came out as, you know, series of name dropping. Uh, this book came out as a big show off, I will say. I have told you about the language. It is Britain, though it, it, it races through. You will not have any problem uh, anywhere. You will be able to complete this book, I would say, in if you read for three hours, for two sessions, in six hours, you will be able to complete the book. The total number of pages, 416, if you include index, 427. Will I recommend this book at all to you? The answer is an absolute no, I will never recommend this book. If you can find this book for 50 rupees or 100 rupees in a second hand market, book market, then you can buy it. But it is not going to add to your knowledge about Indian politics. Though he claims that he is writing about Indian politics and uh, since 1975 up till uh, 2021 I have talked about Indian politics in detail. I don't see anything. I only see gossip. I see anecdotes. Spending 699 rupees to read anecdotes and gossip, I will not recommend. Second thing, and uh, I would like to put an end uh, after mentioning few reviews that I read about this book. Except one review, all reviews are you know, going over the top, they are saying, oh my goodness, this book is a wonderful book. Uh, we Sanvi has written a very beautiful book in a lucid language and he takes us through 19 politics of Indian politics of 1975 up till 2021. He tells us in detail about his relation with different people. There is only one person who has not written such a glowing review. Her name is Omi Kapoor. She writes for Indian Express. Uh, the review she did for the Indian Express, it was given like, she did, of course did not say that how much star she is giving, but it was like giving one and a half a star on a scale of one to five. So except Komi Kapoor, this book has been lauded and praised by almost all the reviewers across all the platforms, digital, print, uh, television, uh, he's praised. Uh, a lot for this book, but I did not find this book to be praised worthy. This is collection of uh, uh, hearsays, I would say, and this is also a book which could be called a manifestation of narcissism as well as insecurity. There are times when you uh, feel that we Sanvi feels very vulnerable. The only chapter which is enjoyable is the last chapter where we Sanvi writes from the bottom of his heart when he is talking about his relation with his mother which was not very good. And this is the last chapter of uh, 15 pages that you find that it is original, it is uh, honest and we Sanvi is not trying to fudge facts or he is not trying to you know portray himself in the best possible manner. 
That's all I have to say for this book. Thank you for listening to me and next time I will be back with a new book review. Till then, take care. Bye-bye.